Hello and welcome to this uh, special webinar. I would say some of us are now standing more or less on the beach looking out to the ocean and seeing a big wave coming and some of us are in this wave at the moment and for us it's a real real privilege to find out what is actually happening uh, in those areas where the wave is really hitting hard in an attempt to maybe protect us. And with us I have, of course, a very, very renowned speaker, um, Helmut Prosch. He is from the Medical University of Vienna. He's a good colleague and friend of mine. And he is an absolute expert in the area of radiology, especially lung ultrasound and CT. And so, of course, since uh, we all know that COVID-19 is a disease which strongly affects the lung, we're going to talk about that topic as well. And we're going to uh, look at some images to see how patients actually present to have the disease. Uh, can we maybe see Lara and uh, Baldo. Uh, so here they are. Here is Lara and Baldo. Well, many, many thanks for coming on this webinar. I know that you have much uh, on your head at the moment and you're under, I would say, uh, uh, you probably can call it a war zone at the moment, but maybe can you just briefly introduce yourself and uh, where you are from and in uh, what uh, situation you are now? So uh, we work in Tuscany and uh, now the situation is uh, very bad because we have to uh, it's a race against the clock because we have to change the hospital and create a covid zone isolate covid zone so we we had to create a new bed because we have a lot of people with covid 19. And, <laughs> and my name is uh, Baldastare Ferro. I work uh, in the intensive care unit uh, of Livorno with Lara Vignuti, that is my colleague and uh, friend. And uh, uh, we, have, we work most of the time in the intensive care unit with a particular interest uh, in the ultrasound and uh, echocardiography. Well, thank you very much. And maybe can I also introduce you to Jonathan? Jonathan, uh, maybe can you also describe uh, your uh, working environment, if you can call it that, and also maybe your position? Hi. Uh, good afternoon to everybody. And thank you for inviting me to speak to the, during this webinar. Actually, I'm a resident in uh, anesthesia and intensive care in, at the University of Ancona. But uh, last month, I was moved to a more peripheral hospital, that's a middle side hospital, and then it, it ended up to be the red zone, one of the red zone of, uh, of central Italy. And actually we, we have locked down our hospital, so now we don't have any elective surgery. We migrate most of the normal world to a more smaller hospital, and we are, we are a COVID hospital. So people cannot get access to the emergency department, uh, and uh, even they keep coming by car alone, and actually, we, uh, we, we usually have eight ICU beds, and now we arrive today to 36 ICU beds. So our main challenge is do what we are good to do, because you can imagine that we don't have nurses that work usually in ICU. We came back to paper. We have to compute manually input and output of fluids. And so for us, really struggling to do what we, what we normally do. And, uh, and especially we, are not, we were not prepared to such a break. So that's the situation actually. We, we, we feel to be like in war with no bombs. I mean, we have patient coming, arrive with saturation of 55 and we have to, to do something. I mean, this uh, truly really sounds like a war zone, uh, something that nobody would ever have expected to be possible in this uh, extremity. I think, um, how do you cope with these situations now from a very personal aspect? I know, Jonathan, you have a very small kid at home. I know that uh, you are, of course, um, very active in uh, the research space. Uh, how do you actually cope with this on a day-to-day -day basis? The little one has 10 days. And actually, we were living close by to Granny, so we have to move out a couple of weeks ago. We have now rapidly rebuilt a small apartment where we are living. And, uh, and then in, in, I have the ICU shift. And then, as you know, we are working on creating, we have already created a platform to collect data because we, the major frustration is not to understand where the patient goes. We have patient normally intubated for 10 days and we still not see if the patient is going to improve or not. So for me, it's really a demand to, to work 24 hours per day. I mean, I also see this as one of the big problems that there is not enough information at this point. 
I mean, nobody really has the time to really collect data at this point. We're just fighting to survive. And this data is so important because we need to know how to treat these patients. And uh, part of the reason we're doing this webinar is actually to spread this information so that we get your experience and can pass it on to those who uh, will need this information as well. But let me pass the question to Lara and Valdo. Um, what about the situation in, in your hospital? From a private perspective, how do you cope with this? Uh, mm, the situation is similar to uh, that explained by uh, our, our colleague. And this is a, a logistic situation that is uh, uh, awful because you have to convert the hospitals uh, and uh, to introduce new nurses to a new uh, type of work uh, and uh, doctors that normally don't do this type of work doing another another work and uh, so one one problem is the professional aspect and the other is the fear the continuous fear to be infected because uh, uh, we we are seeing many many young patients that uh, with um, a, 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 a very bad uh, prognosis uh, determined by an unexplained uh, multi-organ failure that die and they don't have uh, any uh, previous pathology that can explain this deterioration. So there is the fear and uh, there is the sadness to, to, to not understand why a lot of patients are dying. Mm -hmm. yeah, that sounds really dramatic. I mean, Obviously, it's um, also the health of the healthcare professionals, which is very, very important. Um, I mean, especially since we're also the caregivers. Uh, and if, uh, you know, we cannot give care, then we cannot help the patients. And uh, is it correct that you're now using um, healthcare professionals from other areas, from um, disciplines that are not usually um, in the setting of intensive care unit uh, to assist you there? Yeah, uh, lucky in, in our uh, department, in our hospital, we are trying uh, to uh, create some uh, multi-professional uh, uh, um, team. team, yeah, that um, can uh, afford the, the problems, uh, uh, in particular in the infective disease department. Uh, um, some pneumologists are going to do non-invasive uh, ventilation and uh, we as anesthesiologists and critical care doctors are going there to help uh, to reduce the possibility to, of intubation to avoid uh, uh, the, 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 the complete occupation of uh, our intensive care unit. And we are going to open another intensive care unit with uh, eight beds that is very uh, far from our commonly used intensive care unit with other nurses that commonly don't do this work. So it, it, mm. it's a very difficult. Let, let me ask a question to Helmut, um, because we're in a different situation now. Um, how are we preparing now for such a situation or what is being done now, especially in the radiology department, which will definitely be in confronted with the situation of COVID? Yeah. Uh, what we did in the last few days, we uh, tried to prepare ourselves for the situation. We uh, cancelled our elective imaging uh, procedures, so only urgent cases are now scanned, being scanned. And we reserved one of our CT scanners exclusively for patients who present with symptoms which could be COVID or with patients uh, who have COVID. Uh, so we try to separate patients who are infectious from patients who are not. And also the, uh, all the surgical uh, procedures are now being limited to the ones who need to be done in order to make space for uh, at the intensive care units. So it's, we're yeah. still waiting. One question that um, is on my mind, and I think we'll have time to discuss that, is first of all the presentation of the patients, but also um, we come into situations that I can imagine where you will have to decide uh, where will you put your efforts and where do you think you can get the best outcome. Um, uh, what is your take on this and uh, how do you manage this in your, your practice? You know, when, when the war arrives, you, you should be prepared, first of all. But uh, we didn't, uh, we, we have not been prepared to fight this war. And uh, our uh, hospital 
try to put the best uh, effort uh, to remodulate the occupation of the intensive care unit uh, or uh, the bed in the hospital. But many of patients uh, arrive uh, at the emergency department uh, and uh, they need uh, uh, an intensive care unit because they are they have uh, uh, very important symptoms in, in which uh, only monitoring or, or um, low intensive care is not recommended and uh, they deteriorate very very fast and um, so it, it's uh, we, we cannot uh, uh, understand the, the evolution of the symptoms and the prognosis of the patient when they arrived at the emergency department, as we do with the other pathology like uh, pulmonary edema or uh, heart failure or stroke. Mm -hmm. So we put there in a, a department, try to give the best care that we can and we bet mm -hmm. on them at the moment. Yeah. Uh, if we look at the death rates, and if you look at the number of people who have actually uh, died around the globe, uh, we now see that obviously China is uh, very far up there and you've got Italy and uh, Iran, Spain, US. But what is really intriguing is if we go down now to uh, look at how many patients die with respect to the amount of patients there are, we see that there are very, very big um, differences in, I would say, mortality. Um, you might not really call it mortality because uh, it's much too early to, you know, to decide whether or not the patient will die or not. But it does show a trend. It shows a trend that some areas have a much higher mortality than others. And I was just wondering uh, if you have an explanation. Maybe Jonathan, you can comment on that and, and wh why you think that uh, you know, in Italy we have such a high mortality opposed to other parts of the world. So this is a really interesting uh, question. Actually, there could be different explanations. We, we started now to test only symptomatic patients. And actually, mm -hmm. uh, so you, you, you have to have moderate sign symptoms to go to the hospital and be tested. So that can explain uh, why we have higher mortality compared to tests. And, uh, uh, and then we, we have a, one of the whole population in Europe, and we have uh, uh, a social system where usually granny take care of also of kids. And we know that children are usually asymptomatic and they can spread the disease. Indeed, we are, we have, we are seeing, yes, uh, younger patients, mainly obese younger patients, but we are seeing a lot of patients that are above 65. I mean, I definitely need, we need uh, testing. I think this will be very, very important because we need to find out uh, what the number of infected uh, patients actually is to prevent the disease from spreading. And uh, I can only reiterate what I've um, also heard from other colleagues from Italy. That one of the major problems is that, of course, the schools closed and the kindergartens closed, and then the grandparents were taking care of the children. And that's how probably one mode of infection was also spreading to the elderly population. Um, I do also want to answer some of the questions which are coming in because uh, we see that uh, there is tons of questions. We now I see uh, have over 7,500 contributors uh, to the webinar. Um, so the interest in the community is so enormous and we want to give everybody the chance to, of course, learn what they need to know. And one of the major questions we keep on becoming getting is how do we protect ourselves as doctors and what is the situation in the, again, in the Italian environment where I would assume uh, you might have problems uh, that maybe protection devices not even available. What do you do in such situations? So we are uh, we have a, a protection device, individual protection device with the mask, uh, eyeglasses, uh, and we cover our body too. too. And um, when you put all this uh, kind of uh, wearing uh, on you, it's very difficult to work, uh, but you have to protect it. But you, you work with the fear that you can be uh, infected. And uh, you know, uh, in a market, you have uh, an offer and a demand. The demand of these DPI, the individual protection devices, increased uh, a lot in Italy, but the offer is uh, quite low. So we are uh, leaving this uh, unbalance between uh, demand and offer, and we fight to preserve our DPI to work uh, safety. Yeah. Safe. Yeah.
I, th I see this as a big concern. I've heard that uh, some uh, medical professionals we know from China, we know from other countries, have already, of course, um, died due to the disease, and uh, which is very tragic. Many of them are very young. Uh, so yes, we are at risk. And again, I think it's very important. I mean, I can only t tell, if, um, I've been in contact with many, many doctors, and there's a very big sympathy for you in Italy for the situation there. Um, even across the industry, I must say, I've been talking to some people uh, uh, that uh, have uh, you know, asked me how can you provide care and help. So of course, if we can somehow maybe uh, you know, uh, give you the, the, the care you need, uh, that, that would definitely be great. And uh, I can only also say that we got a very kind support for this webinar also uh, from two companies, from uh, Novartis and from Siemens. I want to thank them very, very much for being on board here because it's very important what they're doing as well. Uh, but again, I, I just must state that uh, the sympathy is there and um, you know, we have to learn from your experience. Um, how do we do it in our hospital, Helmut? What, uh, is, uh, the, 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 how do you protect yourself or how is it planned to protect? A tough question. Uh, we are currently behind, lacking behind, fortunately behind Italy. So we are, uh, we, as mentioned, we have a, an area of, the, of our department which is this defined as the potential infectious area with a CT scanner which is reserved for these patients and there we have the full protective cloth, uh, clothing. And in other areas it is still the fear that we might run out of uh, masks and so forth. So we, as long as this is still contained, we uh, have to mm -hmm. save our material as well. Yeah, that's a big issue. There's a shortage. Um, there's uh, now initiatives to get more of these uh, protective gears uh, to us. And there's also, of course, uh, some uh, um, you know, initiatives to produce them uh, in Austria ourselves. So th this is a big, big concern for our country and our doctors. Um, but I guess we really have to uh, share the resources we have. And um, I just want to mention that too, because it's uh, I just recently I uh, came across a, a video that was posted by a doctor uh, showing that uh, actually some people are stealing materials in hospitals. Um, and at the moment, what is happening is that um, you know, hygienic materials such as, for example, disinfectants are treated almost like uh, opiates uh, and not given out anymore because uh, we have to take care of the resources. There's so several questions already. Yeah. Um, there are some questions. Do you want to take one of the questions? Um, um, one question was in regard to these ground glass opacities. What do they reflect on a pathological level? We don't know, uh, honestly, but we know it from a few autopsies performed from, from China. And what we see there is diffuse alveolar damage with the formation of these hyaline membranes. So it's a combination of a interstitial edema and also alveolar edema. That's the place where the infection is going on. So it's not the place of super infection. That's where the COVID infection or the uh, COVID is going on. Yeah, yeah. Um, I see that there's a lot of fear. Uh, Jeannie has asked the question, uh, what can we expect in New York City? I don't know if you're aware, but there was an explosion of cases now in New York City. Uh, people are working and looking in a very close vicinity. So yes, definitely this is a concern there as well. Um, I guess um, the answer to that is not an easy. It's just, uh, I guess, um, uh, what we do not want to have is that it explodes and that we cannot control anymore. And that's exactly why we're doing this webinar to protect us from this. But we have to be aware that this is certainly something that uh, can hit all of us. And um, that's why it's so important to, to prevent it from happening in the first place. Good. Uh, do you want to maybe just mention something else uh, in respect to the epidemic and uh, testing? Yeah, there are a number, of, a number of questions about the tests. And I think the test um, policy depends on the availability of tests. So here in Austria, they are now ramping up uh, with the tests, but still they have to, to select patients who get tested because we still are not there where we want to be. Uh, tests will become available. What we hear is from each and every country, mm. but testing is really important. Yeah, it's, a, it's a big concern here as well. Doctors are afraid here. Um, we might have more infections among our doctors than we maybe some, uh, we have some of cases in our hospital already and we don't know if there's maybe more. Um, you know, some have actually mentioned that maybe it would be good to just have the antibody test because if you know who has antibodies, then that would have definitely be good. Yeah. I mean, all of you who are out there, I think we have to be aware that we as doctors are now in a completely different situation. It's not, um, you know, helping a patient. And, you know, we always said that the true hero is always the patient because he is risking his life. But in this situation, it's a bit different. 
uh, we are also risking our life and so I think uh, in, in a way uh, I can only say that uh, yes there's a lot of sympathy and uh, you know we can only hope for all of us and for the rest of the world that we will not come into a similar situation and it uh, definitely will give all the support to those people who will need it. Um, you know maybe in that respect I can only mention that uh, you know I think one of the big difficulties that we see here is that this information flow needs to go and that's exactly why all of these tips are so important. Uh, what we can do on our side is obviously also to provide you with information of how you for example can provide um, uh, or can perform lung ultrasound and we're actually planning a lecture. We're filming that on Sunday and we're going to distribute that obviously for free to everyone uh, to look at so that they maybe have some tool in their hands that they can use especially in these critical situations. Um, I know, Henwood, you are one of the leading figures in uh, the area of lung ultrasound. Do you want to maybe just uh, discuss how this field is evolving and uh, what some of the pitfalls are? Why is it not really being used as much as it should be? I think uh, one of the, the domains where lung ultrasound is primarily used is the intensive care uh, to monitor patients, to uh, diagnose complications. And uh, Italy is uh, actually uh, in the forefront there. They are yeah. most of the, many of the most prominent uh, researchers in that field are coming from Italy, some from France and Germany as well, but then they're really experts uh, coming from Italy. And the thing is, uh, what you need to, to, to do in lung ultrasound is you have to scan, you have to get your experience. Uh, it is like with all ultrasound procedures, you can get the basics from, from lectures and from books, but at the end of the day, you have to do that on a daily basis, scan your patients and get uh, used to your machine because the ultrasound machines vary in their, uh, in their ability to show these artifacts and you have to get used to uh, how these pathologies look on your machine. But in essence, it's a, it's a, it's a method which is not that difficult to, to, to learn and uh, you have to start right now. Yeah, it's, it's uh, quite easy. You know, we always said lung ultrasound is not a technique that we should be using because lung is the barrier to ultrasound, while air is the barrier to ultrasound, so it's not a technique that should be used. But we now learn more and more, uh, aside from lung, there's many other applications as well. But uh, just, just because I'm seeing uh, so many questions appear here on the, on the screen, uh, we now have somewhere in the axis of 450 questions with all the questions which just came in before. Uh, I'm afraid we will not be able to answer them, but we were expecting that. And so actually what we were built in the background is a little bit of a knowledge base. Uh, this is a web page that we created now. We call it Doc19. I guess you all know why we chose the name. And here uh, will be a kind of a platform, a resource where everybody can get the answer to what he's asking. Um, we of course have not uploaded all of the questions yet and we're waiting for some of your questions to come in so we can answer them. We'll put them there so everybody can read them and they're always available in a very simple format uh, in the format of an FAQ uh, format. So that's what we're going to ask you some of the questions and many of the questions from here, especially I see on hygiene and how we should protect ourselves, but we'll answer questions on um, what are you supposed to do in special clinical situations? How can you treat patients? Lung will be a very important topic there. Uh, so visit us there, sign up and please be, feel free to also put your questions on there and um, we'll see if we can uh, recruit more people uh, that uh, will work on these questions to provide a true database that we can all share. Um, okay, so I think we will go back to maybe Lara and um, and Baldo, maybe you can you show us uh, the case that you have because I know you've uh, collected some very, very interesting um, cases or figures. And uh, if, you, if you don't mind, I will play the slides from, from our side so that um, you don't need to switch them and I can simply just comment on them. And I think you can see them on your screen, can't you? So uh, the X-ray is not quite bad, but the situation underneath is just very, very bad, like you see in CT scan. So scan is the best uh, exam, CT scan is the best exam that you can take if, you, if you're if able to have. <laughs> mm -hmm. so. um, another thing is that uh, the, the x-ray is similar to the clinical symptoms because when the, the patient uh, arrived at the emergency department, uh, he, he has uh, most of the time a dyspnea but when you put some oxygen, uh, he, 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 he start, uh, yeah, he starts to breathe normally, and uh, you think that is going, all is going well. But when you perform a CT scan, many times you see a, a, a very bad situation in most part of the lung, and uh, 
talking about what we see in the lung, uh, I um, when when you do uh, this CT scan, is is like when you the CT scan is similar uh, to uh, an autoimmune disease. Uh, I have seen a patient one uh, years ago with a, a lung vasculitis that presented with a, a CT scan very similar to that we see uh, we have seen in COVID-19. So the in autoinflammatory uh, disease uh, in in this pathology can be a, a, a key in understanding the evolution uh, of this pathology. Maybe the damage of the virus on the lung is not the, 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 the most important thing that we have to take care. Because if you see, you, you have a, a spreading of the pathology from the peripheral part of the lung to the central part of the lung that is typical of uh, uh, immune uh, uh, involvement uh, of, uh, of of the inflammatory involvement uh, of uh, of the lung and tolishizumab maybe, yeah maybe i can just ask uh, helmut uh, you saw the ct you're an expert is this a, a case where you would say it's a very severe form or how would you interpret this that it's at least quite extensive form of this disease the case i showed you before were these limited cases and i showed just this limited case because i knew that you had this more extensive cases. If you look at this picture, as mentioned also already by Baldo, this is not specific. You find this, this CT picture in a number of diseases, in edema, in infections, in, in uh, pulmonary hemorrhage. And also when it comes to infections, you would primarily consider inf uh, viral infections, but it's not specific uh, for um, this disease. So this always has to be seen in the, in the context, in, in, in a in the times we are living, the most likely diagnosis is COVID. The question for me is, um, maybe you can also comment on that. It's probably not the matter of making the diagnosis because the diagnosis has pretty much been established through the tests and the clinics. It's probably more looking at the prognosis and how we can uh, manage the patients. Unfortunately, there is no uh, system on how to predict prognosis in these patients. As far as I know, there are some, um, some proposals to do that. But as, as of now, we look at the extent of the disease and the more the worse, that's easy to say, but we don't know exactly to which, which patterns indicate a worse prognosis. Problem is lung has only a limited number of reaction patterns and that's what we see. We see here an ongoing reaction uh, towards the stimulus, towards this injury. Uh, let me have uh, Jonathan again, because I know that he's very strongly involved in trying to figure out what the risk populations are. Jonathan, what approach are you taking? What it seems to be the worst prognostic factor is age. Then it's really scary because we have patients older than 70 years old with almost no comorbidity that they don't survive. Mm -hmm. And um, and this is really uh, well, it's really difficult to, to understand because we were measuring a lot of laboratory uh, values. We saw that uh, creatine phosphokinase and LDH are more increased in severe patients, in non-survival. We also know that, um, that the dimers elevated have, uh, are related with the bad prognosis, but these are all a specific factor. So the reason, again, we, why we create this data, international data set is exactly to try to uh, register more information and try to find out the clusters of patients because we, we are working with intelligent, artificial intelligence and we think that the new methods of artificial intelligence can help to find cluster of patients. Because of course, uh, obesity is uh, prevalent and hypertension is prevalent in, those, in the patients, but we don't have many women, for example, obese. We have few we, me, women, we have a lot of men, we have young male that are overweight, but not in one individual factor is associated to prognosis except mm -hmm. age. So patients mm -hmm. above 70 years old that are admitted, that they require admission in ICU, they have really the highest mortality as long as we have seen. And talking with other colleagues, we always end up to this conclusion. So, but mm -hmm. making a triage also on age is really crude way. We need something. At the moment, we are giving chance to everybody, but we have 
reach the maximum bets, ICU bets we can afford. Uh, and still we have patient intubated after two weeks and we don't see the direction. We have some idea. I, I totally agree with Prosh about the fact that the, the edema uh, that you can see in the, in the city is one of the uh, major pathogenic factor because it seems more to a left, uh, a left heart failure than a normal RDS. These patients are full of water and that's why they improve uh, with PEEP, with high PEEP, and also they, they keep a compliance. So uh, the lung can still breathe normally, have really high PEEP. That's not at all what we see in usually RDS. So, and there are other characteristics, like all patients get hypolbuminemia. They get marker of edema. If you use PICO to measure the extra lung water, then they have a re almost double the level of normal value. So I think edema is really a trigger or like in the pathogenic way. Yeah. As a matter of fact, one of the questions we got from our users was, is it different from uh, AR, uh, from uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome or not? I guess the question was answered. Would you agree with that, uh, um, Baldo and uh, Lara? I think that uh, when, you, when you have not heart failure causing edema in the lung, uh, the problem is uh, inflammation. So the cause inflammation of inflammation in this situation is or the cytolytic effect of the virus or the inflammation or the lung the, uh, determined by the infection. So again, I think that uh, to take care about this edema, uh, the ventilation maybe is not the key, but we have to understand the mechanism of this uh, edema and to fight it uh, uh, before that the inflammation spread up. Maybe we are using anti-inflammatory drug at uh, important like tolicilizumab or immunoglobulin or plasma as uh, written by Chinese uh, colleagues. And maybe we are uh, doing these therapies uh, very late when the inflammation spread up so maybe the indications uh, in this situation are different we have to discuss uh, maybe with the rheumatologist uh, maybe i have an interference because my brother is a rheumatologist but uh, he, he taught me uh, he taught me about this for me is uh, an auto-inflammatory disease a very uh, bad auto-inflammatory disease that must be it mm, cured before that the inflammation spread spread mm -hmm, yeah. yeah many open questions i think of course um, what uh, jonathan said we need more data on this and we will present uh, at the end of the webinar we'll present of course the platform that he started which is a fantastic initiative where um, intensive care units from all around the world can participate to enter their data so that uh, we can get more meaning and i like the aspect of using artificial intelligence there as well but maybe we can go on with your case because I actually interrupted you in the midst of it and we're not through uh, your presentation. Um, so we saw the CT and um, I'll just switch to the next slide. And I think in a few days, the X-ray going worse. So these patients are going bad very, very fast. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, as we've seen, when you start uh, to take care about this patient, you see a quite normal X-ray and the deterioration is very fast. Uh, there is a, a moment in which the patient compensates very well, and uh, in uh, a few, few hours, the patients need intubation. And uh, what we have seen uh, in a lot of uh, X-rays that uh, there is a deterioration of opacities in the X-rays, but there is uh, two an enlargement of mediastinum that can be considered in this pathology, I will present some echocardiographic images uh, later so you can discuss uh, with us because you, you are an expert about this. So, um, yeah, we'll be and, glad to take a look at the echoes. <laughs> yeah, uh, so uh, you have a deterioration X-ray very, very fast. If you go we, with the next slide, uh, you, you will see instead that these patients recovery their uh, lung are very 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 slow and they need the intubation for a long period 
so it's not uh, quite it's not uh, an edema it's simple edema because uh, it doesn't uh, disappear so so fast as a pulmonary uh, edema and uh, um, go go to the next please and so we have seen uh, professor uh, showed uh, uh, showed us the B line pattern of the, the interstitial syndrome. Um, maybe we should just uh, go on. I think you still have one more slide or two more slides to show. And I think that's also very important because I also want to come a little bit to this topic of how difficult it is to work as a medical professional within uh, a setting where you are, of course, in, at risk yourself with all this protective gear. Um, what are some of your experiences here? Yeah, uh, this is a uh, uh, tracheostomy and we used a combined ultrasound and bronchoscopy, the bronchoscopy guided the tracheostomy. In this situation, it's good because there are not ev evidences that uh, the ultrasound is better than the bronchoscopy when used together or not. But uh, in this case, you, uh, you, you, you must be sure to, 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 to do a, a good puncture at the first attempt. So when you use a, a combined ultrasound and bronchoscopy, you, 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 you can be uh, more sure than uh, in other circumstances uh, in which you, can, uh, you, are safe, you are in safe condition. But uh, in this situation, uh, you see, uh, when, when we perform a tracheostomy, we, 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 we stay um, a long time uh, uh, and it's very uh, we are very tired when the the procedure finished because uh, we we sweat a lot uh, it's awful it's awful and uh, uh, when when you when our colleague will try uh, it, it will be very tired for all i think yeah we definitely have a lot of um, uh, understanding for these situations. Like many of you have probably worked in, in patients, uh, seeing infected patients, but there you can, of course, uh, go back and see normal patients again, but very frequently you will you have to work in an environment. We only see these patients. Uh, so that's a really, really big burden, um, I guess, also on all of us with uh, probably, you know, night shifts after night shifts, uh, taking care of patients, a really, really big uh, burden on all of us, absolutely. Uh, a question maybe to you, uh, just a very quick answer, uh, because I've been asked that and um, I also see it's been one of the questions that I've been asked quite frequently. Do we see myocarditis? Uh, maybe Jonathan and maybe both Lara and uh, Baldo, what uh, is your, is it a simple answer? Yes, no. Is it, do you we see it? Does it occur? Yeah, I think we start to see because we start to look at that. If yeah. we don't look at that, maybe we can have a delay in the diagnosis. But I think now that we have the first data from China saying that uh, around 15% of patients can have the disease, then we started to look at that. And I think we yeah. can find even more than 15%. Yeah, we see an elevation of troponins in many patients and CKs. That's what I've at least been reported. Um, Lara, Baldo? Yes, we see that troponin is high in these patients, and so we start to look at the heart. <laughs> okay. so, um, and, and you see, you can see the enlargement of mediastinum in the X-ray. Maybe mm -hmm. if you see more deeply, you you will uh, you will see uh, subtle uh, myocarditis in all patients, mm -hmm. like in all viral uh, infection. But in this case. Uh, I don't understand why in uh, most patients with uh, the important myocarditis, the right ventricle with uh, low pulmonary pressure is involved. I have seen two cases uh, and I don't, I, don't, I don't understand why. Mm. I guess there's a lot of things we need to figure out. Um, let me just give you a short update. We, I just see that we have probably a close to 12,000 unique viewers. So this is a huge crowd who has been interested here. Uh, of course, we cannot cover all the topics. I'll maybe just shoot a few questions very quickly so that some of them are answered because one question that keeps on arising is, are there late sequels of the disease? Uh, Michael was asking, uh, what about uh, permanent lung damage, uh, lung fibrosis? There is a report in the literature. Um, maybe uh, do you have, of course, we probably don't have as much experience, but have you heard about that? And uh, We know this from SARS. In SARS, we saw a number of cases with uh, fibrosis. 
in um, this new disease COVID is not that well established. It is to, to expect to expect it to be see, seen, but we don't have enough data here. Okay. So I can't really report from our data. Okay. Jonathan, have you seen this? Well, I agree. I mean, we what we have looked in is a report on SARS-1, and actually SARS-1 had higher mortality. And but if we transpose the results to SARS-CoV, then then the future can be really scary because in SARS report that up to 36 percent of patients that recover then develop fibrosis at six months. So that's also what something that we could have to take care after the outbreak. Mm -hmm. A question that is popping up. Uh, do you use high flow oxygen therapy for COVID patients? Yeah, uh, we, um, we use uh, uh, the high flow oxygen ventilation to improve oxygenation uh, when it depends uh, how many uh, ventilators or uh, are uh, uh, needed to or uh, occupied by other patients we uh, mm -hmm. but uh, we don't understand if uh, in this situation high flow oxygen oxygen therapy ventilation or uh, non invasive ventilation is the best one to improve oxygenation be because uh, how i explained before maybe when you put people on the, the lung you have a good increase of the pf but you can delay intubation and doing another damage to the to the lung. So uh, maybe uh, high flow oxygen ventilation is better in this situation where there is a lot of inflammation on on the lung. But okay, no, so you also have to consider with the high flow nasal cannula, you have a high spread of the virus in the in environment. The, in, in, the, in the environment, yeah. so yeah. you. Uh, to be careful mm -hmm. to use it. <laughs> yeah, be, because uh, there there is a danger to to yeah, use uh, any an equipment or, or another when it, where you use a uh, high flow oxygen ventilation. You have uh, forty uh, or fifty or liters more. Uh, or more uh, for mm -hmm. minute that are going to through to to through the nose. And if you are near the patient, you can take all the spread of. Uh, uh, of the air from the patient that is not good for us. So it, it depends from the environment. In my opinion, uh, it, is, it is good, May, but the, you, you must select the patient. The right patient. I think um, we should slowly come to an end. I see there's uh, many, many, many more questions. Like I mentioned, we don't have the time to answer all of them. Uh, please, we have them now in our database and we will try to answer them and uh, put them on the platform uh, doc-19. So uh, please, uh, you know, of course, uh, log in there, send some more questions and look if you find your question there. And definitely uh, think this is something that uh, we want to push further and get more information on. Um, I do want to thank very, very much, first of all, all the people who've been working on this. It was a tremendous uh, effort on our side uh, because we are now in a lockdown as well. We had uh, it's very difficult for us to organize things. Our technical team, um, you know, uh, Julio and Alex, and of course Robin, who's been here, and Stefan, uh, they've done a tremendous job in organizing this through all difficulties with difficulties in lines. And we usually do that in our studio setting, but here we're now almost in a little bit of a shack. Um, still, uh, we try to make it as, uh, of course, comfortable uh, for you out there as well to see. I also want to thank the sponsors who've uh, kicked in and helped us to support this because obviously there's a financial need uh, to produce something like that. And I can only also thank um, the speakers. Um, up front, very, very much our Italian guests. Uh, they're, they're dear friends, uh, long you know, f friends of uh, the community. And um, you know, I know again that this is something that is uh, time for them that they could maybe spend with their families and relax, uh, something they would need as well. Uh, but they're still so dedicated in treating patients and you can again be assured that we have all the sympathy for you and all the support that we can give you. Um, and um, um, I'm sure we got so much from you during this webinar that will help us and maybe even save lives. And of course, I also want to thank um, Helmut. Um, I, I, I do uh, think that uh, this information about lung ultrasound and CT is just of enormous importance because um, it's a very simple tool, especially lung ultrasound, that will help us uh, to make the diagnosis early. So again, thank you very much. Stick with us. Uh, let's see if we can maybe put up um, 
and, and, and webinar again. And thanks to Jonathan as well. Yes, uh, of course. Yes, I, I just meant the entire uh, Italian crowds, of course. Jo yes, I do want to show a few things at the end because I think it's just important that you also see this too. I promise that. And that is the database that um, Jonathan put up. You've got the um, web address on the bottom. Um, we can, of course, send it to you if you are interested, if you are working in an intensive care setting where you are seeing patients, um, where you are maybe uh, also in a position to uh, get your head of the department to contact uh, Jonathan and to, to maybe take part in this initiative. It will be enormously important because that's where all the data should go together so that we find out what is really, really the problem um, in these patients, obviously to help others. So again, thanks again. Thanks, Baldo. Thanks, Lara. Thanks, Jonathan. Thanks, Helmut. And thanks to the team again. And hope to see you maybe soon on a webinar where we can give you information that I hope is important for you. Thank you again.